Spirit of Endurance by Jennifer Armstrong, illustrated by William Mott. When Ernest Shackleton was young, he fell in love with books and adventure. At 16, he set off to sea to explore the world. His most famous adventure took place in Antarctica in January of 1915. On Shackleton's third expedition to Antarctica, the frigid waters on the Weddell Sea that borders Antarctica froze over. Shackleton's ship, the Endurance, became stuck in the ice. Shackleton's goal was to be the first explorer to trek 1,500 miles across the treacherous continent. Would he and his crew triumph, or would the ice prove to be too much? The weather outside Endurance's cozy cabins was terrible. Furious winds howled across the ice. Blizzards drove snow into drifts against the sides of the ship. Sometimes, the wind was so fierce that it pressed the ice folds against Endurance. The ship's wooden timbers squeaked eerily as the pressure grew stronger. The force of the ice was so great that Shackleton began to worry that the Endurance would be seriously damaged. What if they were forced to abandon the ship? One night in July, at the height of a winter storm, the pressure grew stronger than ever. Shackleton shared his fears with the captain, Frank Worsley. If the Endurance does have to, well, get left behind, we will manage somehow, Worsley said to the boss. Shackleton replied, We shall hang on as long as we can. It is hard enough on the men as it is. Without a ship in which to shelter from these blizzards, and in this continuous cold, he broke off and paced the cabin. He didn't want to think about it, but as commander of the expedition, Shackleton had to prepare for the worst. Here is a picture of the members of the Endurance expedition focused as the ship sailed south. Shackleton is in the center, in the hat and buttoned white sweater. Second in command, Frank Wilde, is standing behind Shackleton's left shoulder. Next to Wilde is the captain of Endurance, Frank Worsley in the white sweater and seaman's cap. Here's a picture of Frank Hurley on the left and the ship's meteorologist weatherman, Leonard Hussey, playing chess during a night watch. The ice continued to press against Endurance through August and September. On some days, it rammed the ship so sharply that it knocked books and tools and equipments off shelves and made the masts tremble like twigs. The men were becoming frightened and jumpy. Each time the ship let out a squeak or groan from its straining hull, they held their breath. The crew dismantled the dogloos and brought all the animals back on board because they were afraid that the ice would break up under the dogs. One day in October, the ice pressed non-stop against the sides of Endurance, pushing the ship over on its port side. Everything that wasn't fastened down crashed onto the decks. For several terrifying minutes, the men thought the ship was done for. But the pressure stopped and Endurance settled back into place. They were safe for now. Then, in the third week of October, the pressure started up again and continued without relief. Endurance groaned and creaked as the ice squeezed from all sides. The timbers began to buckle and snap. Water began leaking into the hold. The crew took turns at the pump, trying to keep the water out, but it was no use. On October 27th, Shackleton looked around at the ship, which was being crushed like a nut in a nutcracker before his eyes. She's going, boys. I think it's time to get off, he said. Then the crew of Endurance abandoned ship in the middle of the frozen sea. Luckily, the destruction of Endurance happened in slow motion. This gave the crew plenty of time to unload food and equipment. As the ship continued to break up, the pile of gear on the ice grew larger. Suitcases, books, clocks, sleeping bags, guns, crates of flour and sugar, clothes, lifeboats, diaries, axes, scrap lumber, toothbrushes, buckets, everything that could be taken off the ship was removed. The crew worked without a break. Their survival would depend on saving everything that might come in handy. 
Finally, exhausted, they pitched their tents and crawled inside to sleep. Meanwhile, the timbers and rigging of endurance snapped and crashed onto the deck of the dying ship. While the rest of the men slept, Shackleton held a conference with his second-in-command, Frank Wilde, and with the skipper of endurance, Frank Worsley. With no way to communicate with the outside world, they were completely on their own. If they were going to survive, they would have to rescue themselves. They came up with a plan. They would drag their three lifeboats filled with food and equipment across the ice to Paulette Island. It was 346 miles away. When Shackleton told the men in the morning what lay ahead of them, they reacted calmly. They trusted his leadership. If he said they would walk 346 miles, then that was what they would do. Captain Frank Worsley's logbook describes the day Endurance was abandoned. The ship was not abandoned one hour too soon, for shortly after we had camped on the flow, we could hear the crushing and smashing above her beams and timbers. Here's a picture of his logbook. The dog sleds, each loaded with 900 pounds of gear, went in the lead. The drivers struggled to hack a path through the jumbled ice field with axes and shovels. Behind came the three boats pulled in stages by 15 men in harness. They dragged one boat forward a quarter of a mile, left it, and returned for the second boat. When the third boat was hauled up to join the other two, they began dragging the first boat again. But it was torture. The surface of the ice was broken and uneven, and then the men sometimes sank to their knees in freezing slush while the snow swirled down onto them. After two hours of backbreaking labor, they were only a mile from endurance. At this rate, they would never reach Paulette Island. The flow they were on was solid. They would set up camp and stay put. Ocean Camp was to be their home for the next two months. They returned to Endurance for more equipment and food. With lumber rescued from the ship, they built a cookhouse to hold an oil stove. Then they settled to wait. Shackleton knew that the ice they were camped on was drifting north and would carry them to the open ocean. Eventually, they would need to take the lifeboats. Once the ice drifted into warmer waters, it would not be stable enough to camp on. Their only hope of rescue lay across the water, so the carpenter worked on improving the boats and making them more seaworthy. The Antarctic spring was underway now, and the temperatures sometimes climbed into the 30s which seemed almost tropical to the men. They continued to hunt to exercise the dogs and keep themselves busy with books and card games and chores. Just keeping their gear dry in slushy ocean camp was a steady job. Slowly, the ice drifted away from Antarctica. Large cracks appeared on their ice floe. The surface became soft. November 21st brought an unforgettable event. The broken, twisted wreck of endurance finally slipped through the ice and sank forever. In December, Shackleton decided they should move again, hoping to narrow the distance between themselves and Paulette Island. But the going was tough. It still took three days to cover seven miles. After two more days of back-breaking effort, it looked as though they were stuck. The ice was mush and unstable. They couldn't go back. They couldn't go forward they would have to make another camp. They called this one Patience Camp, and Patience was what they needed. The year 1915 was drawing to a close, and the new year was before them. Here is a picture of dragging one of Endurance's lifeboats across the ice. What lay ahead? Shackleton couldn't be sure. The drift of the ice was haphazard. Sometimes they were carried north, sometimes east or west. The months of February and March dragged by. By early April, the ice flow that Patient Camp sat on was alarmingly small and leads of open sea surrounded them. Killer whales spouted in the water as they hunted seals. The men could feel the rise and fall of the ocean lifting their flow, and some of them began to feel seasick. On April 8th, Shackleton gave the order, LAUNCH THE BOATS! Thousands of birds circled overhead as the crew shoved the boats off the ice. Sitting on their gear and their last crates of food, the men bent to the oars. Waves crashed against the icebergs. The three boats picked their way through the maze of ice, pulling north toward the open ocean. As the light faded, they began looking out for an ice floe to camp on. Shackleton spotted one. 
Luckily, a large seal was sleeping on it, and the men quickly killed it and cooked it for dinner. Then they pitched their tents and tried to get some rest. The next days were filled with danger and hard work. Once they left the shelter of the ice pack, the violence of the open ocean met them like a hurricane. Waves broke over the tiny crowded lifeboats, and howling winds and sleet lashed the men's faces. The temperature sank. The men could hear ice crackling on their clothes and on the sails that now filled with wind. Sleep was out of the question. They were low on drinking water and short on food. The men were beginning to break. Shackleton feared that the boats would become separated or that some of the men would die of exhaustion. But ahead of them somewhere lay a tiny rock islet called Elephant Island. If they could make it, they would be able to rest. At the limit of their strength, the men saw Elephant Island between tattered racks of mist. They had been in the boat for seven days, climbing giant waves, trying to keep from freezing. Seven days with little sleep, little food, no water. When at last they landed, the men fell to their knees on the shore, weeping and laughing. It was the first time in almost a year and a half that they had stood on solid ground. Elephant Island was solid ground, but it was also uninhabited, and winter was approaching. They would not just wait for a ship to come along and rescue them. It might never happen. After three days of much needed rest, Shackleton announced that he would take the best boat, the James Card, and sail back to South Georgia Island over 800 miles away to get help. He would take Captain Morsley for his sailing skills, the carpenter Harry McNeish, in case the boat needed repairs on the way, and three other men. After he reached the whaling station, he would return to rescue the crew. McNeish reinforced the boat. The men collected fresh water from a glacier on the island. They made the James Card as seaworthy as possible. On April 24, 1916, the James Card shoved off. For more than two weeks, Shackleton and his five-man crew sailed across the stormiest ocean in the world, facing 100-foot waves, bittering temperatures, and hurricane-force winds. The 22-foot boat was often covered with ice, and the men had to crawl across the decking while the boat heaved and pitched to chop the ice away. They slept in shifts, crawling into the boat to grab what rest they could. Worsley navigated the best he knew how, although conditions were terrible. In order to calculate their position, he had to be able to see the sun at noon, and with the stormy weather, that was possible only four times. If they lost their way and missed South Georgia Island, they would be headed out into the vast Atlantic Ocean, and that would mean certain death. The men were constantly drenched with salt water and spray as waves broke across the boat. They ached with cold. Shackleton kept them going with hot meals and drinks, six times a day. Lighting their little cabin stove on the bucking boat was tricky, and the moment their cocoa or stew was ready, they put the stove out to save fuel. They learned to eat and drink their meals scalding hot and let the food warm their numbed bodies. If Shackleton feared they wouldn't make it, he never let on. Day after day, he sat at the tiller scanning the horizon, and with Worsley's almost miraculous skill with compass and sextant, the battered boat and its exhausted crew reached the island on the 17th day. There was just one problem. They had landed on the southwest side of the island, and the whaling station was on the northeast side. The boat was too damaged to risk sailing it around in the stormy waters, but the interior of the island was blocked by a range of jagged mountains and glaciers. They would have to cross it on foot. Two of the men were completely broken down, and a third would have to stay and look after them. That left Shackleton, Worsley, and second officer Tom Crean to make the hike across South Georgia Island. The voyage of the James Card. Only 22 feet long, the boat had two masts and three small sails, and is steered by a rope yoke attached to the rudder. Worsley calculates the card's position by sighting the sun through an instrument called a sextant. The cutaway shows the cramped space below, where one man sleeps in the bow, and two prepare a meal using a camp stove. Their mountaineering equipment wasn't the best gear they could have wished for on a climb such as this one. They had an axe and 50 feet of rope. They studded the soles of their boots with nails for a better grip on the icy peaks. They rested for several days. Then with food for three days and a small camping stove, they set out 
crossing the first snowfield by moonlight. Months of poor nutrition and inactivity had left them in no shape for a rugged hike. But as the boss said long afterward, the thought of those fellows on Elephant Island kept us going all the time. If you're a leader, a fellow that other fellows look to, you've got to keep going. That was the thought which sailed us through the hurricane and tugged us up and down those mountains. South Georgia had never been crossed before. There were no trails, no clues which passes led to safety and which ones led to sheer drops. The men rested and cooked quick meals and pushed on. The boss didn't dare let them stop to sleep, fearing that they might lose the will to continue. On they trudged, hour after hour, through the first night and a day, then another night. By the next morning they were haggard, exhausted, and trembling with cold, but they were within sight of the eastern coast. Faintly, from far below, came the sound of the seven o'clock whistle at the whaling station. They had reached safety at last. Back on Elephant Island, the rest of the crew had no idea of the boss's triumph. Once the, once the James card had disappeared from view, the 22 remaining members of the expedition set to work. Frank Wilde and Charge decided on the first task. An Arctic winter was sweeping up from the South Pole, and they would have to shelter themselves from it. They scavenged the beach for rocks and built a low foundation. Then they took the two remaining boats, the Dudley Docker and the Stanham Wilms, and turned them upside down over the stones. The tattered canvas sails were lashed across the boats, and the chinks in the walls were stuffed with moss to keep out the wind. They rigged a chimney from small sheets of metal and installed the blubber stove. When they were done, they had a crude hut to wait out the winter in. The first storms came quickly. While the winds howled outside their cabin, the men kept each other company. A popular pastime was listing their favorite foods. After a steady diet of seal meat and penguin, the men dreamed of fresh fruits, cakes, and roast beef. The hours passed slowly. The days passed slowly. The weeks passed slowly. Camp Wild was a dreary place. There were jobs to do. Ice had to be chipped off the glaciers and melted for drinking water. There were penguins and seals to hunt, and there was an operation to be performed. Percy Blackborough's feet had frozen on the boat journey to Elephant Island, and the gangrene had set in. Now the toes on his left foot were dead and black and had to be amputated. There were few medical supplies left, but the expedition's doctors, Jane McElroy, and Alexander Macklin performed the surgery by the light of a sea oil lamp. Outside the hut, the wind screamed over the cliffs of Elephant Island. Sea ice crowded the shore. They knew Shackleton could not return until winter was over. Here is a picture of the rescue. Shackleton returns to Elephant Island to bring home his men. In the background is the Yelcho, the ship that Shackleton borrowed from the Chilean government for the rescue attempt. Wilde tried to keep the men optimistic. Every morning he rolled up his sleeping bag and said to the men, Get your things ready, boys. The boss may come today. But as the months went by, they began to wonder if today would ever come. When Shackleton, Worsley, and Crean walked into the whaling station on May 20th, they looked like wild men. They were in rags, their faces black from oily smoke, and their hair and beards long and matted. Dogs barked in alarm as they staggered to the station manager's house. "'Who are you?' asked the manager. "'My name is Shackleton,' the boss replied. There was a stunned silence. No one had expected to see Shackleton alive, let alone see him come walking down from the peaks of South Georgia Island. But when the boss had told their story, they were treated as heroes. The three weary men were given hot baths and hot food and allowed to sleep. As soon as they awoke, Shackleton began arranging a rescue party. Worsley set out in a boat with some of the whalers to pick up the men on the other side of the island. A steamer was outfitted to make for Elephant Island, and Shackleton left at once. But the weather and the ocean were against him. He was forced to turn back for South Georgia Island. Twice more he tried, but the cruel Atlantic winter was too brutal. June and July went by, and Shackleton was desperate to get his men. At last, in August, he took a Chilean ship called the Yelcho and made once more for Elephant Island. On August 30th, George Marston, the expedition artist, was keeping lookout at Camp Wild. On the horizon, he saw the smoke of a ship's funnel. Shippo! he yelled. The Yelcho steamed into the bay, and the boat was lowered over the side. 
It was Shackleton. Are we well? He shouted as soon as he was near enough. Yes! The men crowded around the boss as he landed, shaking his hand. We knew you'd come back, one said to him. They had all survived. Shackleton had returned to take them home.